Well, good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for joining us for the May 20th Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health uh, Mental Health Forum. We are, um, like always, we are recording this webinar and we will be posting the recording on our website. Um, Shaylee will, add, will put the website in the chat um, for those who don't have it. Um, and uh, we just a few housekeeping notes. Um, one is that it will be a uh, talk followed by a Q&A from the audience. And so you can put your questions in the Q&A using the Q&A feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen. That's the best way. Um, if you have any technical issues and things, you can let us know. We can try to deal with them on the chat. Um, and um, we will not be having a forum next week. Next week is Harvard um, School of Public Health's graduation week. Um, and we will be starting again in June when we will uh, do alternate weeks in June and July. So we'll have two in June and two in July. Um, so let's get started. We're really lucky today to have a guest speaker. Um, one of the um, nice things of I guess one of the silver linings of this time is that we are able to have speakers from um, other institutions join us at Harvard and um, participate in the forum without them having to travel. And so today, we're really lucky to have to, to have Dr. Joanne Davila, who's a professor of psychology and associate director of clinical training at Stony Brook University. And um, the topic that she's going to talk about today, love in the time of COVID, is something that many audience measure, members have requested over time, and something we didn't really feel like in our own in our group we were really the best people to address. Um, and so she's published widely in the area of close relationships and interpersonal functioning and psychopathology, and is co-author of a book um, called *The Thinking Girl's Guide to the Right Guide to the Right Guy*. How Knowing Yourself Can Help You Navigate Dating, Hookups, and Love, um, published by Guilford. And her current research focuses on romantic competence among adolescents and adults, romantic relationship education for young adults, the interpersonal causes and consequences of depression and anxiety, and well-being among LGBT individuals. Um, she's a fellow in the, American, in the Association for Psychological Science, the American Psychological Association Division 12, which is clinical psychology, and the Association for Behavioral, Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. She's also editor of the Journal of Consulting and Clinical Psychology. She's a licensed psychologist who specializes in evidence-based interventions for relationship problems, anxiety, and depression. Um, so we're really happy to um, have Dr. Davila join us. Thank you, Joanne. Thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. So. Um, I'm going to talk with you uh, a little bit about relationships and love today. So one of the most significant impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic is its effects, effects on relationships. COVID-19 has created an environment that's changed and often strained relationship dynamics. Yet people really need relationships and, they, and the support that they bring more than ever right now. So uh, today I'm going to discuss some of the challenges that people face and some of the skills they can use to navigate relationships during this difficult time. So let's start with the challenges. So we'll move on to our next slide. Um, so although social distancing, one of the key mechanisms in flattening the curve, involves a reduction in some social connections, it results in an increase in time spent with partners and families due to sheltering at home. Now on the positive side, relationships can provide a sense of safety and security. However, a key feature of security is the balance of intimacy and autonomy, right? being close and having our separate space. And this balance may be disrupted by partners spending more time together than usual, which can potentially lead to conflict or dissatisfaction. So just some basic examples, people's personal routines are disrupted right now because both people are in the house together. So maybe you're used to getting up early and doing your yoga quietly, but now your partner is there and they're listening to the news loudly or want to have coffee with you. Or, um, you know, there's no private time unless you make it these days if you're living with someone. Um, when it comes to intimacy, the stress that we're all feeling may make us feel less wanting of intimacy, be that sexual intimacy or even emotional intimacy, or perhaps we need it more. So there really can be these challenges with navigating 
how, uh, how much closeness we want and how much separation we want from our partners. Now, another hallmark of a secure relationship, of a healthy relationship, is being able to adaptively communicate and support one another, uh, which also can be more challenging in these times, right? The pandemic is a stressor. Um, and in addition to the unique effects that stressors can have on us as individuals, stressors really require partners coordinating lots of, this stressor really requires partners coordinating lots of new things within their relationship. Things like working from home together, managing childcare in new ways, dealing with financial struggles, uh, dealing with uh, chores and things like how are we getting our groceries and all these new things. And stressors really tax our ability to relate to each other in these adaptive ways to communicate, to support each other. So partners may need even more help now than they might usually uh, need to, to navigate these new changes. So for example, right, uh, you each, uh, if people are both working from home, you both have different needs to get your work done, right? That has to be communicated about. Um, someone might feel so personally distressed or drained that it's hard to have anything to give the other person in terms of supporting them. Maybe somebody uh, really needs um, caretaking for their health concerns or health issues, and that gets in the way of you getting your own needs met, right? Sometimes we turn our own needs into family needs, right? If I feel like I need to get outside the house and get some fresh air, I may try and convince everybody that that's what they have to do, even though they don't want to, right? Um, we might expect people to just know what we need, even though we're not communicating. We might hold things in until we explode with them. So there's lots of ways that um, communication and support of each other can be problematic right now. And also because of the stress of the pandemic, we need to manage our own feelings. We may be feeling more tense right now, more short tempered. Maybe we're feeling more anxious and afraid. Maybe we're more sad. So, you know, these are emotions that um, are going to be heightened in the face of everything that we're dealing with. And it's really important that we know how to handle those. It's also important that we know how to navigate these kinds of challenges because we know that what happens in people's romantic relationships is related to their physical well-being and their mental well-being. So if your relationship suffers during the pandemic, you might be even more prone to feeling physically ill, to feeling anxious, to feeling depressed than you normally might be. Now, I just wanna add one additional thing, which I'm not gonna speak a lot about, but one of the worst relationship situations is the likelihood for increased risk for intimate partner violence or aggression when partners are sheltering at home, particularly when they're under stress. So in situations where violence is already occurring, it may escalate and partners may be unable to get away physically and emotionally from an aggressive or abusive partner and that puts them at high risk. So identifying and assisting um, people who are at risk or in danger is going to be critical. Now, I'm not going to speak in detail about this today. I'm going to focus more on navigating challenges in non-abusive relationships. But I do want to point it out. I want to encourage anyone in this situation to seek out resources and external sources of support. Okay, so these are some of the relationship challenges that you might be facing. What can we do about them? So I'm going to talk to you now about how my own research can help. So if we go to the next slide, um, I study something that I call romantic competence. So romantic competence is the capacity for people to function adaptively in their romantic lives at all stages of the relationship process, regardless of relationship status, and regardless of the type of relationship that they're in. So this really applies to anybody. And romantic competence is characterized by three skills, insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation. And I'm going to tell you what each of those are. So on the next slide, you'll see that insight is all about awareness, understanding, and learning. So with insight, you'll be able to know yourself better, right? Who you are, what you need, why you act the way you do. So for example, let's say you notice that you're getting kind of snappy with your partner. Insight would allow you to realize that you're just stressed about other things and you're taking it out on that person. So it's a sign that you might be overwhelmed, right? You need to monitor that a little more carefully. 
insight lets us know the same things about our partners. Okay, so let's say your partner's spending a lot of time FaceTiming with their friends. With insight, you can realize that it's not because they don't care about you, it's because they're missing the support they used to get or they just need some stress release, right? So it tells us why people are behaving the way they are. Insight also lets us anticipate what the positive and negative consequences of our particular relationship choices might be. So with insight, you might say to yourself, you know what, if I send this really nasty text, that's, not, that's probably not gonna go well, right? That's probably gonna make things worse. And insight also lets us learn from our mistakes in ways that allow us to make better decisions in the future. So let's say you notice that you're planning a lot of activities for your family because you think it's gonna be better for them. But they actually don't want to do those things and everyone ends up getting really frustrated. Insight can tell you then that actually you need to do things differently and not just keep trying to do things that don't work. So this is the, these are the kinds of things that insight will give us. If we go to the next slide, we'll see that mutuality is all about understanding that both people have needs and both sets of needs are important. So if you are approaching your relationship from a, a point of uh, mutuality, you'll be able to communicate your needs in a clear, direct way that increases the chances that you're gonna get them met. So let's say your partner wants to have a friend over for social distancing in the backyard or on your patio or something like that, but you're really exhausted. You don't really want this. You might say something like, you know, I'm fine with you having them come over, but I can't hang out or do anything to prepare or clean up because I'm tired. If you want them to come over, I'll need you to take care of everything. So that's the kind of direct communication that we engage in when we're practicing mutuality. We're saying what we need clearly so there's no ambiguity. With mutuality, we're also willing and able to meet our partner's needs. So if you're taking a mutual approach, you might say, you know what, I know how much my partner loves taking a walk first thing in the morning, right? It makes them feel better. So I'm gonna support my partner in that, even though I'd rather we stay in bed together, or I'd rather we get up and help the kids get ready for something together, right? So you're giving something to your partner that you know is important to them. And mutuality also lets you factor both sets of needs into the decisions that you make about your relationship. So let's say you have different ideas about when it's gonna be safe to do certain activities or to see certain people. You'll need to find a compromise that um, meets both people's needs. So for example, let's say your partner really wants to see their aging parent, but you're not sure it's safe. A mutual approach might mean that they might visit the parent, but only with very specific safety plans for you know, wearing masks and not touching, plans that you two develop and respect together. So that's mutuality. On the next side, you'll see emotion regulation. And this is all about regulating your feelings in response to things that happen in your relationship. So if you're using emotion regulation, you'll be better able to keep your emotions calm when you're upset about things and to keep things that happen in your relationship in perspective. So if you find yourself thinking and you know, oh my gosh, this is terrible and what's going on is horrible. With emotion regulation, you might say, you know what, wait a minute, maybe I'm overreacting. Let me calm down, you know, things will probably be okay. We're gonna figure out how to deal with this, right? So you keep things calm. Emotion regulation lets us tolerate our uncomfortable feelings rather than acting impulsively on them. That way we can think more clearly about our decisions and our actions. So. If you find yourself saying like, hey, why isn't my partner texting me, right? And you're getting really anxious about this and you're texting them over and over again, emotion regulation might let you say, you know what, wait a minute. Let me stop this. I can just wait. I can see what, ha see what happens. Nothing has to be done right now. Everything's probably okay. I don't have to keep checking my phone, right? So you'll stop and you'll think before acting. And if you're practicing emotion regulation, you'll be better able to maintain a sense of self-respect and commitment to your needs, even when difficult things happen. So let's say you and your partner have a big fight. You need to think about how you wanna behave in that situation 
to maintain self-respect? What actions are you gonna take that are gonna allow you to feel okay about yourself as a person rather than acting in a way that you might regret or feel bad about later? So it's really important to calm your emotions so you can think clearly about that. So these are the skills, insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation. Now we've conducted a bunch of research on, on these skills, um, on this construct of romantic competence, mainly among young people, but we think it applies to everyone. So let me tell you a little bit about what we found. So if we go to the next slide, you'll see that in our research, we've done a number of studies now with many people, we've found that greater romantic competence, right? Um, using the skills of insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation, this is associated with greater security in a relationship. So feeling more secure, feeling more safe in your relationship, being able to trust your partner, okay? Greater romantic competence is associated with healthier relationship decision-making. So feeling more confident in your decisions and taking an approach to decision-making where you're actually kind of thinking through things in a more intentional, kind of conscious way. Greater competence is associated with being more satisfied in relationships. That's a really good thing. Uh, it's associated with more adaptive social support. So we've actually had couples come into the lab and engage in um, interactions right there in the lab where they're trying to support one another. And couples who are more competent do better. They also do better at expressing positive feelings to their partners. Again, we've observed this in the lab. And we've observed couples who are more competent managing their conflict better, so better conflict resolution, all those kinds of adaptive um, ways of relating that are important. We've also seen that on an individual level, greater romantic confidence is associated with fewer symptoms of depression and anxiety. So greater romantic confidence really seems to convey some benefits to couples and individuals. Now, because of these findings, we decided to see if we could teach young people how to be more romantically competent, how to engage in insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation. So we developed a workshop to do so. And on the next slide, you'll see a little bit about our workshop. So the workshop begins with an overview of the notion of romantic competence and a description of the skills, just like I gave you today. And we talk with people about how these skills can help them create things that allow for healthy relationships. And uh, we talk about how the skills can be used in the context of four key issues that are relevant for um, young adults in this case. So um, for young adults, we, we focus on things like helping them figure out what type of relationship they want, what type of partner they want, right? How to identify their needs in a relationship and how to learn how to assess whether their needs are being met. We teach them how to understand, um, how to communicate more effectively with a partner, especially how to resolve conflicts. We focus on knowing how to make decisions about whether they should stay in a relationship or get out of that relationship. And then we help them think about how to deal with breakups effectively. And in the course of our workshop, we focus on evidence-based cognitive and behavioral skills, mindfulness skills, and acceptance-based techniques to help teach people how to be more insightful, more mutual, and how to regulate their emotions. So we conducted a study to examine whether people who got our workshop actually learned these skills. So we recruited a sample of about 150 people, and we randomly assigned them to either participate in the workshop or to be on a wait list to get the workshop later. Um, and the workshop uh, consisted of two meetings of about two and a half hours each where we taught the skills. And then we compared people who got the workshop to those who didn't. We had them all fill out questionnaires right before the workshop started and then right after the workshop ended. And the uh, people on the wait list filled out the questionnaires at the same time. And then again, a few months afterwards. We found some really promising results. So I wanna show you those. So on the next slide, these are some of the results that compared people who got the workshop to people who didn't get it. And compared to people on the wait list, the people in the relationship education workshop, that's the RE group, 
they reported over time greater confidence in their knowledge about what a healthy relationship is and in a greater confidence in their ability to manage relationships. They also reported greater confidence in their knowledge about an ability to cope with relationship problems. They reported reduced beliefs that any relationship can work if you really work hard enough, if you love someone enough. This is something we stressed in the relationship with our, um, with our uh, young adults. The idea, you know, a lot of people had the idea that, but I, you know, I just love the person so much. We can make this work, but that's not always the case. People in the workshop realize that and they reduce their beliefs in this regard. We also saw significant increase, increases in perspective taking. So that's mutuality, right? Taking the other person's perspective, as well as adaptive relationship decision making, this kind of intentional decision making that I mentioned earlier. So the workshop participants learned some important stuff. Now, then we looked at people just who got the workshop. And we asked them to just describe kind of in a qualitative way what they learned. So on the next slide, you'll see that right after the workshop ended, we asked them, you know, reflect on what you learned and how you can apply it to your life. And 75% of the participants who got the relationship education workshop reported changes that reflected insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation. So they said things like, the workshop has made me more mindful about myself and my relationship, especially with what I want and what I need, okay? They said, I learned that both people in a relationship have needs that need to be met and that compromises need to, be, need to take place. That's mutuality. And they said, I can think about how my reactions and choices affect my partner and I'm gonna take a calmer approach to our arguments. That's emotion regulation. On the next slide, you'll see that when we ask them a few months later, did you actually do anything differently in your relationship because of the workshop? Of the people who said yes, almost all of them reported behaviors that mapped onto insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation. So they said things like, I work to understand my feelings better. I think more critically about the decisions I make, right? That's insight. They said, ever since the relationship, I had a talk about my relationship with my partner and I told them that I think our relationship's not healthy. And since then we've talked about that and we've looked for solutions, right? So this is mutuality. And they've said things like, I've been able to resolve conflicts better in a calm manner, right? Emotion regulation. So we think these results are really promising and we're hoping to continue to develop the workshop in a way that allows us to more easily disseminate it to a wide range of people. We want people to learn these skills. And that's why I'm here today as well. So how can you use the skills in your relationship right now? On the next slide, you'll see that to negotiate the challenges that you might be facing in your relationship, you can use insight, mutuality, and, and emotion regulation to understand, communicate, and regulate. Now the skills all work together. This isn't meant to be a stepped approach. It's not linear, like first you use this and then that and then the other one. You actually have to use them all at once. They all, they all kind of inform one another. So let me go through some ideas for how you can do so. So on the next slide, right? Remember that insight is about awareness, understanding and learning. And so the goal here is to identify your needs and what you want and what your values are and how you go about trying to get these things in your relationship. And then to figure out the same thing for your partner, right? You can't navigate difficulties in your relationship unless you know these things about yourself and about your partner. So on the next slide, you see a few steps. And again, these aren't meant to be done linearly. These kind of all have to be happening for you to be um, engaging in insight, in the insight skill. So you need to figure out, like, what's the problem? What's the challenge here? What's going on? What's the nature of the conflict, if there is one? You need to identify your needs, right? What do I need and want? And how am I going about trying to get it? Am I being too forceful? Am I not being assertive enough? Am I assuming that they know something they don't, right? What am I doing here? And then think about the same thing for your partner. 
What do they need? How are they trying to get it? And in doing this, you can identify the consequences. By behaving the way we're behaving, what are, what are the consequences for the relationship? Are we getting our needs met? Are we not, right? So you get to figure out really that like in a better way, what's actually going on here with insight. And then on the next slide, we use mutuality, right? Again, both people have needs, both are important. And then here, what we want is to try and develop some empathy for each other and to come to a workable way for both people to get their needs met, right? And so the next slide gives some steps for doing that. First of all, we need to remember that both people in a relationship have needs, right? This is the core, and it's so hard to remember this sometimes. When we're struggling, when there are challenges, we're really focused on ourselves, or sometimes we're actually really focused on the other person, we lose sight of ourselves. So we gotta remember that both people have needs. We have to then remember to take our partner's perspective. We gotta put ourselves in their shoes. We gotta get some understanding of why they're feeling the way they're feeling, why they're doing what they're doing, right? So that we can develop this empathy. And then we need to unify with our partners against the problem. Usually when there's problems, we start to polarize, right? It's like we get on opposite sides of things and we start to blame each other. But from, from a mutual perspective, we wanna to come together, we wanna to join together so that we can see the problem as something outside of us, something separate that we have to work on together. And in doing so, we really need to communicate our needs really clearly and directly and calmly. So uh, we use what we call I statements, right? Taking responsibility for ourselves, not blaming the other person. We have to move away from the sort of you, you, you and say, I, I feel this way. I'm experiencing this. I need this, right? We need to be really specific, not like, you know, you never listen to me. Because if you say that, your partner's going to say, yes, I do. I listened to you just the other day, right? Really specific, right? You didn't listen to me when I was talking with you about X. And we need to use our soft emotions. Nobody wants to be blamed and approached in a hostile way. If we tell somebody that we're feeling hurt, they're going to take that a lot better than if we tell them how angry they are or what a jerk they are, okay? So communicating clearly. And then listening, really listening to what our partner has to say so that ultimately we can engage in mutual problem solving. We can come together and say, what do we have to do together to deal with this problem? What, what solutions might there be? How can we compromise here? So mutuality. And then on the next slide, emotion regulation again, right? Regulating our feelings. And the goal here is to help our emotions so that we can let them help us. Emotions are signals to us. They're signals that guide our behavior. They tell us, hey, something's going on here, something we need to pay attention to. So they're important and they are guides for us. But they can also go awry and get in the way of healthy behavior. So on the next slide, we've got some, some tips here for regulating our emotions. And the first tip is to slow down and observe. What am I feeling? What is this thing I'm feeling? And then to reflect, why am I feeling this way? And what's underneath it, right? I'm angry, but underneath that, am I just hurt? Am I scared, right? What's going on underneath it? Why am I feeling this way? Then relate to ourselves, actually. Have a talk with ourselves about our feelings, like, What's happening here? We have to use our emotions and use our reason, use our logic. Like, you know what? Maybe I need to just calm down a minute. Maybe I need to think about this a different way, right? We need to relate to our emotions in a way that can calm them down. And that's the next tip, right? We need to soothe our emotions, engage in something that's calming, whether it's talking with ourselves in a calming way or doing an activity that feels more soothing something that lets our emotions relax a little bit. And that's gonna allow us then to select what we wanna do, to intentionally decide what we wanna to do to deal with our partner, to deal with the challenge we're facing, to deal with this emotion that we're feeling. And then we can start to convey what we need 
and convey our feelings with these more soft expressions that I've been talking about, rather than being hostile and angry, what's underneath there. And if you really can't do any of this, take a time out. Let your partner know you need a time out to just get your emotions calmed down a little bit. So on the next slide, we see, to summarize, that we can use the skills of insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation to understand, communicate, and regulate. And this is gonna help us better navigate relationship challenges. So to conclude then on the next slide, you've really got to be skillful to navigate relationships. And if you use insight, mutuality, and emotion regulation, it can really help you do so. It can be sort of your, your guide for how you're gonna get through some of these challenges. So I just wanna thank everybody on my next slide, my team at the Relationship Development Center, my collaborators, and of course, Stony Brook University. And now I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. So for some reason, I'm having trouble starting my video, but I'll just get started by saying thank you so much, Dr. Davila. That was very helpful, and it was such a needed talk in this time. We're all facing unique challenges in all areas of our life, um, including relationships. So thank you so much for breaking down this complex um, concept, like romantic confidence, in such a clear and easy to digest way. I, I really appreciate it. I'm sure everyone else did as well. Great. Um, so we do have a few questions that have filtered in and we'll continue um, as more come in. So one question was about, so your focus is, like you mentioned, on younger individuals and uh, those who are young adults. Somebody asked about people who are in their 60s, 70s, or 80s and whether they are more set in their ways and if there are any biological, cultural, or other factors that may make older individual maybe less flexible or adaptable, maybe less able to use those skills, if you know anything about that. Yeah. So um, I think everybody has the potential to use the skills. The reason I like the skills is because they're, they transcend, I think, um, you know, age and type of relationship and all of that. But it is true that um, as people age, some people certainly do get more set in their ways. That doesn't mean they can't be open to possibly changing, but it is important to um, have a sense of the extent to which you or your partner is, are, are able to engage in some of these um, skills. So for example, um, I, um, know some people where one partner is, is, you know, very open to these skills, but the other partner who is a, a you know, uh, uh, an older person really um, is a little more set and really doesn't seem to get the idea of mutuality very well. Like, and so to, no matter how much the one person tries, the other person just doesn't get it. And so sometimes that's real in your relationship and you have to recognize that and you have to have a sense of, um, you, you know, using your own skills to kind of negotiate around that. So if you're in a relationship with someone who doesn't get mutuality, for example, and can't relate to you in a mutual way, that means that you probably have to really use your own insight skills to recognize that and your own emotion regulation skills to deal with your upset around having to um, face the challenge of having a partner who can't be as mutual with you as you might want them to be. So um, yeah, so that can really be, be tough. But I encourage everyone to try. That's great. Yeah, and I think you also touched on another question that somebody else had about people who have less mutuality or have trouble with mutuality, especially if they may have um, maybe on the, you know, continuum for, um, for um, like with Asperger's or mm -hmm. um, other autistic sort of uh, Yeah. So in terms of another question that we had is about how success at work is correlated with success in romantic relationships and whether there are factors that impact both or how those two things impact one another. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, well, what we do know from the data is that when things are going wrong in our relationships, that can um, you know, affect our performance at work. So we know that, that problems in relationships can have a negative effect on work performance. Um, and so um, we can probably extrapolate to say that when things are going better in one of those domains, people might be doing better in the other. We also know that external stressors, stressors outside of our relationships really impact the relationship and work stress can certainly be one of those things. Um, uh, you know, one easy example is when people are working a lot um, and they have less time for their relationships, that can absolutely impact relationship satisfaction. Um, when people are under a lot of pressure at work to perform, same kind of thing. So we know that there's kind of a two-way street there. And I think that's really relevant now when people are out of work or maybe people are working harder or there's a lot of work stress that people are navigating right now. Was there another part of the question that I'm forgetting? I think that, yeah, I think you touched on most of it. So yeah, okay. that makes a lot of sense. So maybe a related one, and I think since you started to touch a little bit on this as well with what's going on currently with COVID, um, how does this pandemic play into the additional stressors that people are facing? And are, do you have any suggestions for any strategies that can be applied um, given the, the current challenges, which I know you touched a little bit in the beginning? Yeah, I think this is, um, a lot of this is where emotion regulation is going to come in because we really are, everybody in, in different ways will be under stress and some people less, you know, less so and other people much more so. And so um, we, I think we have to give each other some room for that right now. Um, people are, you know, under extreme, extremely stressful conditions, people can behave in ways that are not typical for them, right? Or that are um, real like, uh, like exaggerations of how they might usually behave or think or feel. And so I think we have to give people space for that. We have to use some mutuality there and be empathic and give some space. And we have to use some emotion regulation as we're dealing with that. When we are the ones who are stressed out, we also have to recognize that as well and do our best to try to help ourselves or seek out help if we need in order to manage because um, you know, it's, it can be very hard to do that on your own when you're experiencing a level of stress that you might not have ever had before. That makes a lot of sense, that insight and knowing when to seek help and what's going on for you internally as well. Um, someone has a question about online dating and another person about long distance relationships. So maybe with online dating during this time, we can combine the two together. Is there a specific question or just general sort of like... Yeah, any recommendations or advice that you have for individuals navigating either long distance or online, online dating during this time? Yeah. Well, let me start with the online dating thing. It's interesting because at least anecdotally and by media reports, there's been quite the uptick in online dating right now, not surprisingly because people are social distancing and not engaging in in-person dating as much as they may have, although that's not entirely true. Um, but with online dating, um, I, you know, I think that I've also you know, heard anecdotally that people are more wanting of relationships right now, at least some people are. It's made people sort of think like, oh my gosh, like. I actually really want to be with someone. So people are seeking this out more. Um, uh, so a couple things. One is I think uh, it's really important to uh, get a sense of what each person is wanting and looking for with online dating, because some people are still doing online dating for hookups, casual sex, those kinds of things, and other people may want something else. So, so really clarifying that using your insight skill to clarify that for yourself in advance and, and trying to figure that out so that you can pursue things that are really relevant for what you actually want, I think is really important. I think um, taking, you know, this is, this is a good opportunity since people are socially distancing more to take more time to get to know people through online dating um, and get a sense of whether this is someone that you actually might want to um, pursue uh, a relationship with going forward. Um, so, um, you know, I think that's really important. 
Uh, I think we have to be careful. Uh, you know, everyone's got, obviously everyone's got to, to figure out their own comfort level with social distancing. Um, and we have to, I think, be mindful and careful and make intentional decisions about how quickly we decide we want to engage in person or engage in sexual activity with someone. Um, it can be uh, easy to want to jump into things, I think, uh, for some people and perhaps at a time like this for, for, some, for some folks. And so we want to think carefully about making intentional decisions about uh, those kinds of choices uh, in order to protect our, ourselves and our health. So um, for long term, excuse me, long distance relationships, I think, you know, that's just, it's, I, I'm not entirely sure whether the challenges that long distance relationships face now are different than what they typically face, other than perhaps not getting, you know, perhaps not having regular visits in the way one might have, um, but really thinking about when uh, there will be regular visits again and what those will look like and when that feels safe again. I think those are important um, decisions that, that people have to make. So that's a few things that come to mind. But if there are more specific questions, I'm happy to address those. That's great. Thank you so much. So another question that has come up from a few people is if there are any cultural differences in the ways that people might um, implement the skills that you talked about or address them, uh, whether there are patterns um, that differ. Yeah, there, uh, there absolutely um, are. Now, we haven't studied them in my lab specifically, so I will just speak more generally. I'm not speaking based on any data that we've collected, but um, I think it is, it's extremely important to consider the relevance of the skills and how you would use them based on um, cultural values uh, in your particular group and in your particular relationship. Um, you know, it's really, I think, very important to respect uh, the cultural norms that are important to individuals and that, that um, capture relationship dynamics. Uh, and then to think about how you might use the skills within those. Um, and perhaps in some ways that may come come up most for mutuality in cultures where there are um, more uh, specific norms for power differentials in relationships, for example, uh, for decision making, uh, who makes decisions in relationships, and, and those sorts of things. Um, I would not advocate trying to do implement a skill that could actually make a relationship worse <laughs> uh, than, rather than, than better. Um, and so I, I think insight and emotion regulation are skills that are, are pretty applicable, um, generally speaking. Although again, there's different norms for, for emotions. In fact, in some cultures and in some relationships, intense emotional expression is just what the norm is. And Nobody thinks, you know, it's, it's, it's not um, considered to be potentially uh, problematic if people are extremely expressive or, or you know, using more anger-based language. And so if that is the norm and it's not actually creating problems, well, if there's no, if it's not broke, then you don't have to fix it, right? So uh, I would say that it's important to think about the skills in the context of those kinds of things. Makes a lot of sense. So thank you for answering that. So another one, another question that I see here is, um, and let's see, scrolling a little bit. Um, somebody is asking about, um, sorry, let me scroll right back. Oh, managing, um, when the, especially during this time when there's might be if there's some codependency and how to set healthy boundaries given you know people are in close spaces together and how to have their own needs met um, while meeting their partner's needs. Yeah, that's really important. Um, yeah, and I think this is a great place where the skills come into play. And um, the. I think the open communication about this is going to be critical, um, not just kind of following along in the typical pattern or cycle that you usually engage in. I think it, 
it really has to be discussed in a very um, careful and empathic and caring way that gets buy-in from the more dependent partner to understand um, that the other person has needs as well and to really think about how how the two the two are going to coordinate that um, it may be legitimately the case that one person's needs are more uh, intense or, or significant than the the other um, so for example i I know a couple where one person has um, uh, uh, lost their job and um, and uh, is afraid their business will go under, which is a major stressor, uh, and that this person already has some challenges um, with dealing with emotions. And so in the face of this, the person is having a lot of trouble. And so the, the partner in the relationship is doing a lot of caretaking there. Um, at the same, and, and needs to, uh, because the other person is, is really fragile. At the same time, um, you know, she really needs to get her needs met. And um, so they've been having conversations about this and finding ways to navigate this in, in small ways that, um, you know, giving her some separate time to have more conversations with friends or to do the things that, you know, she really uh, finds um, soothing and caretaking for her and um, figuring out times when the, when the distressed partner is feeling a little bit better. And in those times, you know, seeing what, you know, whether there can be a more mutual set of circumstances. So there's a lot of navigation that has to be done around this and it needs to be done in a very open and caring way. Makes a lot of sense. Um... And somebody brings up a good point that culturally in the U.S., do we potentially put a lot of stress on ideal marriages and that only 8 to 12 percent of marriages are truly happy? Um, and whether more um, our expectations of relationships and the needs that they meet um, ought to be different or have a different focus. As, yeah, those are excellent ideal. questions. Yeah, yeah. I, I do think that in general, uh, here in the US, we um, have these very romantic ideals for relationships. And we set these standards that they should be perfect, everyone should be happy, we should get our needs met at all times. And um, that's completely unrealistic, in my opinion. Um, so, um, you know, my approach is not that people need to strive to have perfectly happy relationships, but people need to strive to have healthy relationships where each person is getting their needs met as best as they can. Um, and, and um, you know, that's going to differ for different relationships. Every single relationship is going to have challenges. Every couple is going to have some sort of conflict or something that needs to be negotiated. Um, it's, it's, that's just the reality. And that is not bad. That's not a sign of a problem. A sign of a problem is when people can't actually navigate those things in a way that leads them to feel, you know, safe in their relationship, that leads them to feel basically secure in their relationship. That's kind of what I think one of the hallmarks of health is, that, that people feel safe and secure. Not that it's perfect all the time and everybody's always getting their needs met at every single second. That's just, it's not possible. So, and relationships really, um, they change over time, they ebb and flow, they develop, they grow. Uh, and I think that's another thing that, that um, our society doesn't really recognize that well. Um, and related to the, the other point that was brought up that um, we also, I think, on average in the US have this idea that our romantic partner should meet our every need. Um, and I, I personally uh, think that that is unrealistic. I do think that um, that relationships, or romantic relationships, should meet or some basic core needs and needs that may be different depending on who you are and what relationship you're in. But that we do have needs that that can get met and perhaps maybe even be better met by uh, friends, extended family members therapists, you know, other people in our life who, um, you know, can really, you know, support us in different ways. 
So those are my thoughts. Thank you. That makes a lot of sense. Um, a person, another person here asks about their their child who's an adolescent, um, and given your expertise with adolescents, they ask about specifically teaching, I'm guessing, insight, and they're mentioning that um, the adolescents are not as interested in mindfulness techniques, so how to do this. Yeah. The thing about adolescents in general is to figure out what, um, like to be strategic enough to figure out like what, what, what the hook is, so to speak, like what do they care about enough that um, that they'll want to become insightful, for example. So, um, you know, many adolescents are not that interested in being mindful. Some are, and that, that's great. But for ones who aren't, uh, thinking about, like, what's important to them and what they might want to know, um, it might be a way to introduce the idea of insight. So if they're curious about, you know, what um, members of the other sex you think or are like, well, that's a way to encourage insight by, you know, wondering about that and being curious about it and maybe, you know, asking some questions about it or, you know, something like that. So, so kind of trying to meet them where they are with something that they care about, um, that might make it easier to introduce some of these skills. Great, thank you so much. So we've heard actually for this next question, we've heard that the rates of divorce have gone up and that people are filing for divorce during this times. Um, somebody asked at what point during your workshop do you offer insights up to when a relationship might not be worth salvaging? So when is it um, a time yeah. when people may just not be able to work out their needs or yeah. So um, a big part of our workshop focuses on people learning to um, identify and assess what their needs are and then to assess the extent to which their needs are getting met in their relationship. Um, uh, and so in teaching people that, we help them kind of focus on what they think their real key needs are, because again, it can be different in different relationships, and you know, kind of what their deal breakers are. Um, and then to do kind of a realistic realistic assessment of um, the likelihood that these things can be worked on or changed. So for example, um, you know, if you're in a relationship where you've never felt safe with your partner, that your partner has your best interests in mind, and um, you know, that's the source of your distress, and you've, they've, they've never done that, and anytime you've tried to have that conversation with them, they basically are saying like, nope, I don't care, right? that might be a sign that, that your need is not getting met. It's never gotten, gotten met and it probably isn't going to get met going forward. And so I think that's a way to think about this. Um, we want to be careful, particularly during times of stress to not make um, impulsive decisions. I mean, things are going to be worse now probably than they were. They may get better when the stress goes down. So we don't want to make impulsive decisions, but we do want to kind of look across time and across situations to, to see the consistency in whether our needs are or are not getting met. Um, so I think that's one way to think about, about this. Those are very helpful tips, so thanks for sharing those. And somebody asked about um, Similarly, in, during this time, they've been spending a lot of time together with their partner and about the best way to begin to the process of reestablishing aut autonomy in their relationship. So how to do that given this unprecedented time where people are spending so much time together. Yeah. Yes, right. So some people may get used to this and like it and it may you know, open their eyes up to like, wow, we actually, you know, want more intimacy. But if that's not what you want, then I think that needs to be um, a very clear discussion. Again, a, a, an empathic discussion that comes from a place of caring, not a place of I've got to get away from you. No one's going to respond well to that, but a place of, you know, it's been wonderful that we spent so much time together. And, um, you know, there are still things that I value uh, in my, you know, as an individual that I haven't been able to engage in that, you know, I would like to start engaging in more. And how do you feel about that? And what about you? What about on your side? What would you like more of? And so 
again, have it be that kind of mutual conversation, that honest and open, but, but caring conversation. Uh, and I think that will go a, a long way towards um, partners being more comfortable with that, with, with kind of separating again. Uh, and also keeping open the door for people to express whatever they feel about that. Like maybe a partner might be sad about that and that's okay. That doesn't mean they're, you know, not going to want you to do what you need to do, but maybe they're sad about it. So, so taking care of each other's emotions in that way, I think is really important as well. Thank you so much. So I'm just trying to think about time management. We have about four more minutes left and we also have some housekeeping. So in the last few questions, maybe that, just to ask you, a, a few people have asked about follow-up of how they could take your workshop. I know that you mentioned it was in, uh, you know, with a study, but are there any ways right. that they could learn more about this? So there have been a few questions about that. I'm thrilled about that. I'm thrilled to hear that. I don't have an online workshop right now. It is something that I would like to be working towards in the future. So um, people have my name and uh, hopefully like my website address and you can always check and see if, if we've got anything going on. Um, and I appreciate that because I'm glad to hear that there's, there's interest in it. So um, if there are um, other specific things, um, people can certainly email me. I can't do therapy over email or anything like that. But if someone had a quick question, I could respond. And then um, my, the book that I wrote, even though it was written for um, young women, it actually uh, outlines, and that was the publisher's choice, just so everyone knows. <laughs> uh, it actually outlines all the skills and it has worksheets and things like that. And it's, um, it's available on Amazon. It's really not very expensive. So if someone's really interested, that's a, that could be a good resource for them. Yeah, that's great. And I also wanted to plug your book, actually, because I've given it to friends, I've given it to patients, and to your point, I've given it to veterans at the VA, male veterans as well, as female ones, and they all really appreciated it. So even though it's geared towards younger audience, they got a lot out of it. For sure. Thank you. <laughs> great. Well, thank you so much. So I'll pass it back to Karisten. And thank you. Really appreciated this. Yeah, thank pleasure. you so much. This was um, this was terrific. And we did put a link in the chat to the book to, to where you can purchase the book on Amazon as well as to Dr. Davia's website. So um, look in the chat, folks who want to purchase the book. It is, I found it really quickly on Amazon. So you can purchase it there. And um, thank you so much. And so for everyone, we will be sharing the slides and the recording via our website. And um, we won't be meeting next week, um, May 27th, because it's graduation week. And our next session, our next forum will be on June 3rd. And it will be on staying active to support mental health during and after COVID-19. So thank you so much, Joanne. And stay safe. And um, I hope um, things go well for you. And, I, and hopefully we will bring you back. And let us know if you do end up doing an online workshop, because we will uh, let people know. So thank, right. you. thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Great. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.